story must be told of an ancient tree, an imagined years old on its ridge by the sea. How once it was part of a forest of trees, all its own same kind, their leaves rustling in the breeze. How the others died off one by one, till only it was left alone in the sun. Then weeds overgrew its once unique place, and goats ate its children right at its base. And sad is the tale of this wondrous palm, but the saddest part is yet to come. For one day soon, by herself she will die, no one to witness, no one to cry. And here I will end, my tale is no lie, of the lone Lo'ulu of Molokai. I've seen it happen to about 12 species already where I see the last one die out. And these Hawaiian species that we're talking about, they've evolved over millions and millions of years. So these are really ancient things and we're seeing their, their last stand. die out, you realize that you know you really can make a difference just by cultivating these, just by doing these restoration projects, to hold on to something that took so many million years to evolve that will never get back. are really hard when one dies and it's a very emotional job when you're working with really rare plants when there's only three or four left in the wild. I've only been in the job for almost three years and these plants that I've been checking for three years and then all of a sudden one of them dies it's very emotional for me <laughs> and you know he's been checking them for much much longer. You kind of build a relationship with them almost. They become really familiar to you, and, and it's hard when one dies. Because we're losing species uh, very rapidly. I have seen about 12 species go out and die out in the wild myself, and some of the ones that I have worked with particularly, this Hibiscadelphus swallowiensis on the Big Island, I remember getting a call from John Giffen, the district forester, saying, oh, you better come on over to the Big Island. I think the last tree has died. And, and I remember he and I going to the tree at Puvava, and yes, it was dead, and there were still fruit seeds on it. And we had a moment of silence there. Uh, we took off our hats and, and thought about it. And I remember just thinking, if we really had done nothing, this species would be absolutely gone now. The last wild tree of Hibiscadelphus hualalaiensis died in 1992. Fortunately, seeds were collected and propagated, and 12 cultivated trees were planted in the Pu'uva'ava'a plant sanctuary. Mid-elevation plant nurseries on Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, and Kauai propagate and cultivate many of Hawaii's most threatened and endangered plant species. These division of forestry and wildlife facilities are the heart of rare plant restoration efforts in Hawaii. In order to grow these endangered species, plants and or seeds need to be collected. Uh, Carolyn Korn at the Division of Forestry and Wildlife wanted someone to start growing all these endangered species. I think it was 292 listed endangered species when we began and Carolyn basically wanted us to grow every single one of those if we could, find them, grow them. 
that really threw us into high gear, at least in Hawaii, where we had funding, we had helicopter budget. The main thing was that we, it got us in the field and it got us exploring all through the Hawaiian Islands, refining things, uh, finding new species, and really growing a lot of these things for the very first time. I mean, NTBG had some growing, but now the state, Division of Forestry and Wildlife was in on it. We really have the expertise in the islands. We have the technology to grow every one of our endangered species. So why lose them in the meantime? Why not put a lot of effort quickly into getting their seeds, at least getting some seed storage places going, getting tissue culture labs going, and then grow them and do restoration and outplanting, putting them back in areas where they evolve. Maybe it'll look like an arboretum for a while. Maybe it'll be arboretum style where you have rows and it won't look quite so natural. But at least we won't lose the species because we know if we do nothing, we will. Steve Perlman's passionate stewardship of the natural environment was shaped by his childhood experiences of growing up near a Texas bayou. About the time I turned seven years old and we moved into this house, uh, I just remember being thrilled by the idea of having this bio across the street. And uh, we became bio boys. There were all these snakes on the bio. The bio was really wild. We didn't even know if they were poisonous. We didn't know if they were water moccasins. There were even alligators in there. My family remembers this, that I raised all these snakes that would get loose sometimes in the house and end up in my dad's shoes. And I was also into scouting, Cub Scout, and then a Boy Scout, and later an Explorer Scout. A lot of stuff outdoors. My first job in high school was at a nursery, and that was just doing uh, planting and landscaping and things like that. And when I was in high school, I would vacation in Hawaii. I spent time on Maui and uh, Oahu as well. That was for surfing, because I loved to surf and surf all across California and Texas. So after high school and, and all, I was really thinking to move to Hawaii. When I uh, got married, my wife, Maria, uh, had already been to Kauai, and that was her favorite island. This was one of the most rural islands. That really attracted me, and the most beautiful. Just had the natural beauty that, uh, that just stood out. My very first job I got here was with Olapua Gardens. Uh, they were just starting out this botanic garden, and one of the things they wanted to do was put in a native Hawaiian landscape. I was starting to take some courses at uh, KCC, the Hawaii Community College. The botanical garden here, National Tropical Botanical Garden, was just getting started in 1970. And so I wanted to do a project on endangered species. So I came to the botanical garden and uh, met with their botanist, Daryl Herbs. Daryl uh, had been hired by NTBG because I think he knew more about endangered species than any of the other botanists at that time. At the end of our course, Keith actually hired me as the nurseryman, and I told him, I really want to be a field botanist. This is where I'm aiming. I want to be like Daryl. So Daryl was really a huge influence on me. I would either hike with Daryl Herbst or I would bring in my own collections and he would help me identify them. Daryl uh, didn't like climbing trees or doing cliff work and so that kind of became my niche was that he would send me up the tree to get seeds of Kokia kawaiensis or go out on the cliff for him to get something that he saw out there. So my very first years with Daryl were uh, pretty much uh, filling this niche of the tree climber. It was just like send the monkey up the tree because I knew how to climb trees. Other individuals who greatly influenced Steve were botanists Harold St. John, Ray Fosberg, John Obata, and Ken Wood. A lot of what I got from Dr. St. John anyway was that uh, I should make a lot more collections and that when I do make sure they're large, really try and document everything. And so he really set me on the road, I think, to formalizing my collections. He did start me making a log of my numbers, which I started at number one and now I'm up to 
22,500. Chipper Wickman, CEO and Director of the National Tropical Botanical Garden, fondly recalls a botanizing expedition with Steve in the upper Limahuli Valley on Kauai. I remember one day when Steve and I had, had, had been collecting in Limahuli, and one species in particular we had been looking for uh, for about a year and a half was a native Prichardia. We were certain Limahuli had to have uh, Prichardia, although the lower valley um, had really been denuded of, of, uh, of these palms, probably because of rats and, and uh, feral cattle that had been in the bottom. And one day, as we were up about 1,500 feet on the side of the cliff, uh, Steve looked across and, and we spotted something. We made a uh, collection by climbing up uh, you know, a six inch diameter palm that's 30 feet up hanging over a 300 foot cliff. Sent it off to Dr. St. John and, and uh, really for me, as, as exciting as that day was, uh, what was even more memorable was getting the letter back from, from St. John. My recollection was it was something to the effect of another memorable find, uh, treasure from Limahuli, uh, Prichardia Limahuli and a new species. Steve worked closely with botanist John Obata throughout the 1980s. By 1985, I was hiking a lot with John Obata. Uh, we hiked together uh, two or three times a week because I lived on Oahu. I, I really think a lot of my collecting style was influenced by John Obata. He had been doing his collecting from the mid-1940s, just going cross-country and through the bush. John did not carry a rope, but uh, we would not be stopped by just a steep hill or a mountain or knife ridge. We would just go and go and go. During the 1990s, Steve was introduced to a new hiking and rappelling partner, Ken Wood. Ken Wood, who shares an office with me, is definitely another huge influence on me. Uh, Ken and I did not start hiking together till around 1990 though. For the next 15 years or so, we, we did you know, hundreds of collections together, hundreds of hiking days together. His style with me was that we were just not limited by almost anything. And I, there's no one else that I really hike with that I respect as much as Ken for that style where we would each have ropes in our packs, we could have climbing belts with us, we would not be stopped by waterfalls or anything. Working together as a team, you know, they would go to some places that other botanists had never been to before, like uh, the Kalalau, the whole Nepali coast and the Kalalau Rim. In fact, I think between the two of them, they must have collected uh, 12 or 13 new species from the Nepali. Steve shares a poem he wrote in 1995 when informed about the death of his friend Botanist Ray Fosberg. Gone are the ones who held the light on high to show the way. Beacons of wisdom, age old delight, men of science, pure botany. Heroes were they in a darkening world where ignorance cleared the way, taking pleasure in nature's pearls, putting names on the nameless, gods at play. Echoed names resound in chambers. Once they answered to their call, Fosberg, Degner, Harold, St. John, all were spirited, leaders all. Where is their likeness here today? Explorers of mystery in a changing time. Enthusiasm bubbling over. They broke a mold of ancient clay. And I remember when we climbed up and I was with Chipper and we got to the very top up there and the, the ridge was absolutely like a knife ridge. What do we do now? You know, now we're on this knife ridge and you can't really walk on it. And I kind of straddled the thing and it said, well, we just make like goats like this. And I just, bah, bah. And I started crawling along the ridge and was straddling and crawling and he was just laughing about it. And then we got ourselves into the back valley, went up over that peak got into the stream, and then when we got in there, it was absolutely pristine. I could never keep up with Steve in the field. He was, he's a, such a radical hiker. In the Marquesas, uh, they gave Steve Perlman the name, nickname Tiva. They called him Tiva there because he's kind of like a, a mountain goat, and he'd go up these very steep cliffs as well. And I'd say other really memorable experiences with Steve uh, in, included a day that he came and, and talked to me about 
uh, because I had been had some arborist training and, and worked with ropes, he asked me if I would help um, him go out on the Nepali and rappel down to hand pollinate the Brighamia uh, in Cygnus. And uh, so we devised a, a makeshift belt, literally from a piece of chain and, and some rope. But we were making our own harnesses. We had handmade harnesses. We, we had knotted ropes, and it was not very sophisticated. I worked with Steve for many years. He's a very good friend of mine. I would dare say that uh, there's nobody living in Hawaii that knows the, all of the different parts of all the islands the way Steve Perlman does. I think I mean, a lot of folks know that, uh, that he's always quick to smile and, and make other people laugh. And he also has a way of playing uh, some practical jokes on folks um, in the most unexpected places as well. He belongs in the field. <laughs> We would miss him if he stopped field work, for sure. A note of encouragement for young people considering a career in the conservation field. There's a reason to do all this. You know, that this is your world. Help become one of the stewards of the land. You know, try to work in this profession. There are, there are more jobs than ever in conservation. A lot of this is really exploratory botany kind of still at its best and it's still going on in Hawaii so any young people that are looking at uh, this film that we're putting together here uh, for me the age of exploration is not over I've made a career of doing this myself and have become an exploratory botanist I definitely will not be doing this work forever because I can't uh, yeah and I'm already 63 years old uh, who knows I have worked with people who worked into their 80s or 90s but I can't keep always doing this cliff work, so somebody seeing this film who is very young, teenager right now, thinks they might like to do this kind of work, I would encourage them to try. I think there are jobs in conservation out there. I would love to have young people wanting to do this or feel that what you're doing is important and not, that you're not doing this all alone. So, You know, we really strongly love these places and really strongly want to work to help preserve them and the plants that are there are just a part of it. Uh, we need to preserve the places and the whole ecosystem as well so that that feeling and those beautiful natural places will be there for people in the future. You know, shame if we don't do it and, and let these things go extinct on our watch, more or less. This is when we're here, it's all we've got to work with. Mm -hmm.